And we are live. Welcome, everyone, to today's reading of The Parasitic Mind by Gad Sad. Uh, this is yet another stream with my co-host, Alex Maselli. You can find a link to my sub-stack in the description. Here is the text we're currently working on. Um, so, today we're going to be covering Chapter 5. And Chapter 5 is entitled... Uh, let's see here, not the anti-science, anti-reason one. Uh, chapter five is entitled Campus Lunacy, The Rise of the Social Justice Warrior. Publius Regilius Morrow and Bridger E., hello, nice to see you both. Thank you both for showing up. Um, I'm always happy to see you two here, and I'm always happy to, uh, to have consistent guests. So thank you both for coming on. Um, please, everybody, remember to click the like button and to sign up on the Substack so you can get the dispatches from me whenever I write. So here, I'm going to go ahead and read the first few paragraphs of this, um, of this chapter to give us an idea. One is an excerpt from the essay, I'm a liberal professor and my liberal students terrify me. Oops, let's adjust here a little. I'm a liberal professor and my liberal students terrify me. Um, and he says, I'm a liberal professor and my liberal students terrify me. I have intentionally adjusted my teaching as the political winds have shifted. Hurting a student's feelings, even in the course of instruction that is absolutely appropriate and respectful, can now get a teacher into serious trouble. The tyranny of, and then he quotes President William McKinley, the tyranny of the minority is infinitely more odious and intolerable and more to be feared than that of the majority. Student activist social justice warriors might be outnumbered on campuses, yet they rule via the tyranny of the minority backed by progressive professors and campus administrators. Together, they enforce a stifling climate of political correctness that we associate with things like trigger warnings, safe spaces, microaggressions, and campus speech codes, all of which empower the perpetually indignant and outraged. To progressives, feelings trump truth. Empirical statements are no longer judged by their veracity, but by whether or not they are potentially more bigoted in which case they must be suppressed in the name of inclusiveness. Given that feelings are the engine by which one's existence is validated, a culture of offense has taken shape where it pays to be a member of the perpetually aggrieved. This creates a competitive urge to be positioned advantageously in a victimhood hierarchy. Uh, Alex, do you have anything to say about that? Any first shots at it? Oh, hey, Anton Bjorklund. Uh, just that... Um... The tyranny of the minority is an interesting concept because you don't want to forget about minority views or minority people or uh, demographics, but at the same time, they shouldn't be the dominant voice in any kind of discourse um, because, well, their values are probably not going to help the whole group. But at the same time, if you're pushing out everyone else, you know, we're seeing that with, um, group, you know, uh, in big tech and stuff and academia, uh, minority voices are being pushed out. It's just not the minority that we usually consider when we consider the word minority. Um, so that's, it's, it's kind of weird, but you kind of have to hit a balance. Yes, indeed. Uh, just wanted to say hi to everybody present. Glad to see all the usual suspects are lined up, all the usual gang of misfits. Uh, I'm going to continue reading a little bit to give us a little bit more fodder for discussion here. The Oppression Olympics, Olympics, also known as Victimology Poker, is the arena wherein this competition of victimhood takes place. Using identity politics and intersectionality, I am a queer, fat, Muslim, disabled, transgendered, black feminist. 
to establish the winners of this grotesque theater of the absurd. I propose that the SJWs exhibit a form of collective Munchausen syndrome, a psychiatric disorder where an individual feigns a medical condition to garner sympathy. Ultimately, the ethos is, I am a victim, therefore I am. This fetishizing of victimhood was alluded to long ago by the eminent British philosopher Bertrand Russell in his essay aptly titled, the superior virtue of the oppressed. And of course, the response to this, if you were to raise this argument to anyone, would be, oh, well, Russell was a white male, so he's wrong. And, you know, their reasoning may perhaps be a little more nuanced than that or a little more elaborate, but the fact of the matter is, is when you boil it down, that's ultimately what it comes down to. There would be a big backdrop, and the backdrop would consist of things that we went over in cynical theories about why Bertrand Russell's being a white male makes him wrong. But regardless, the whole point of this is that, um, the whole point of this is that Bertrand Russell's demographics are irrelevant. So he has already pointed all this stuff out. This was all alluded to a century ago. And I would say, uh, although Russell might not like to hear this if he were still with us, Nietzsche in chapter 29 of Thus Spake Zarathustra covered this more effectively than anyone else. He foresaw this by more than a hundred years. Now, it says here, even if you hold a strong hand in victimology poker, do not presume that the progressive mob of SJWs won't come after you. The best-selling author, Ayan Hirsi Ali, is a Somali woman born into the Islamic faith who faced personal hardships at the hands of a deeply patriarchal and misogynistic society. The political host, Dave Rubin, is a gay Jew who used to be a proud member of the left. The journalist, Andy Ngo, is a gay Asian man. Once they violated central tenets of progressivism, criticizing Islam or the radical left, they lost their protective identity shields. So, for example, I have a co-host here who is, a, uh, who is an atheist, child-free woman who, in prior decades, may have called herself a feminist had she been born earlier, um, you know, in terms of things like suffragettes or what have you. But interestingly, uh, that all... Interestingly, that all just goes away uh, if she breaks the if she breaks the ideological sort of um, if she breaks the ideological rules, let's say. So all the people that he listed were people who have a lot of minority cred. And all of the, those people were people who you would normally think would be protected by their identity status. But as soon as they criticize uh, leftist orthodoxy, what happens is, is they are immediately set upon and ousted. And you'll also notice that there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of straight white males who, um, there are a lot of straight white males who are leftists and who get away with saying whatever they want. Justin Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada, had a scandal where dozens and dozens of photos of him wearing blackface decades ago surfaced, and nobody cared. The guy's going to win re-election because he's a diehard leftist, and he toes the leftist ideological line. So lest we think that this is really a war between the minorities and marginalized in the cishet white males, which is not remotely true, that's what they want you to think. What this really is, is, is identity politics being used as a means of dividing people where the people in power, who ironically are largely cishet white males, uh, can get away with whatever they want as long as they toe an ideological line. The purpose of this is to enforce ideological conformity and all of the identity politics stuff is really kind of a smokescreen. Uh, Alex, what do you have to say about that? So, and th this is pretty true because one of the things about this is that the people who are, you know, m most of them are, as you say, um, in power are cis white, you know, males, heterosexual, um, they can, as long as they say the right words, not necessarily do the right things. We see a lot of times where they've done something really, really horrible and are uh, given a free pass because of the fact that they say the right things. And honestly, this, uh, priority of uh, words over actions is horrible. It's absolutely horrible because 
<laughs> my bad. That was my keyboard. Okay. Um, because Good it grief. results in it results in some actual injustice. If someone commits a crime when they're in power, and then but because they say the right things, we're not going to hold them accountable for their crimes. And who that probably you know could have had victims involved. Then that's real injustice. That's real you know uh, imbalance. And they're, they're okay with that. And honestly, like, that's one of the reasons why I'm so against this. Um, and you're right about the, um, the shield of, you know, minority poker going away as soon as you don't say the right things. It does not matter to them at all. They have all these, you know, amazing ad hominems to throw at people once they no longer agree to their ideology. Um, for women, it's the pick me, internalized misogyny, that, uh, you know, self-hating woman, take your pick, brainwashed, uh, handmaiden. Um, but then, uh, then they have them for uh, black people too. They have the race traitor, uh, Kuhn is a very big favorite of theirs for that. And we've seen them use it on people. Um, and it's, it's honestly really horrifying. Um, to see that kind of thing happen because it promotes the idea of the monolithic identity which isn't realistic it's not true and in fact it's reductionist um, it reduces anyone's um, real journey to you know who they happen to be and that's that's really horrible that's absolutely horrible Yes. Now, I would say... I, I would say that this... There's a sort of game plan on the part of the elite. Not to sound conspiratorial, because much of this is organic. And this is one thing that I will have to say in preparation before I say anything else because I think that there is a very, um, I think that there is a very common smear tactic that is used to silence critics of this sort of thing, and that is that they're conspiracy theorists. Now, here's the thing. There is a difference between a centralized conspiracy and a decentralized organic behavior. If you look at a flock of birds, for example, the flock of birds does not have some central bird that plans everything. They all just follow the same rules. They all just follow the bird in front of them, and the flock as a whole demonstrates coherent behavior. And the way that uh, politi political correctness works in much the same way. It generates certain social norms and everyone follows these norms and there are some people who are devoutly politically correct or who are devoutly woke so to speak who are real zealots for this ideology and then there's a much much larger proportion of people who are opportunists who follow this stuff because they think it's necessary in order to have a good reputation a lot of middle class white people will follow woke politics and declare themselves to be woke and say all the slogans because middle class people as a rule are very concerned with reputation so there's no single group of people who plans this. There's no single group planning anything. What this is is an ideology. And this is where progressives will just, where you'll just lose them. Progressives, I have noticed, have this thing where they will play dumb and pretend not to understand anything you say to them. Uh, if you try to talk to them and explain this, they'll be like, what? Huh? What are you saying? You know, they, they have this weird thing where they suddenly lose the ability to comprehend English as soon as you argue with them about politics. So what they'll do is they'll just sort of space out, ignore everything you say, and then start lecturing you on how you don't understand their politics. And this is what they do every time you try to argue with them about anything. And then they'll come back with some sort of... Uh, they'll come back with some sort of straw man or some sort of Mott and Bailey argument. In other words, and a Mott and Bailey is really a straw man of oneself that makes oneself look better uh, than they actually are. So you have to research what a Mott and Bailey doctrine is, and I'll put that in the chat box. You can Google that later. Uh, this is a technique they use to defend themselves, Mott and Bailey doctrine. 
And so, so, so progressives will, you know, they'll accuse you of being a conspiracy theorist. And then if you try to explain why this has nothing to do with conspiracy theories or conspiracies at all, because there's no single secret council that plans anything, they'll just play dumb and act like this all just goes completely over their head and they have no idea what you're talking about. So that's, so, so it's pointless to try to, uh, reach progressives but maybe you can reach some of the people who who some of the middle class people who follow this stuff because they don't realize how toxic it is now anyway i said all that to say this that the whole point of the of identity politics is to divide people and i think that the gambit they're running works like this if you bring about identity politics you pit everyone else against white males and adjacent quote-unquote groups. So you have the cishet white male who is sort of the great Satan. And then you have white women who are also pretty bad. And then you have like Asian males and rich Indian males who are considered to be almost as bad. You know, so you have this few people at the top. And what you do is you pit everybody else against the people at the top. And the way that that works out in the long run is that you end up with this constant sort of uh, pe people constantly being at each other's throats and the only stability coming from centralized institutional power. The only stability coming from things like banks, things like uh, huge corporations, things like government. So this is all very convenient for the powers that be. And you'll find that identity politics is actually used quite a bit by established institutions to quell dissent. For example, uh, What's a good way? What's a good way to put this? I'm trying to think of a good example. You know, if you if you attend a diversity workshop that your employer puts on, and your employer is a Fortune 100 company, you know, some huge corporation, so you so you go to this diversity workshop for your employer they'll be using a lot of this divisive incendiary rhetoric that pits everybody against everybody else. And then nobody criticizes management. So that's just a small microcosm of how this works, but really it's, it's usable everywhere. And also, um, you know, there's, there are a lot of manufactured crises, I think that, or not manufactured crises per se, so much as crises that are taken advantage of by by institutions so for uh you know it was Rahm Emanuel who was a high who was a high level civil servant in the United States and served in a number of presidential institutions made the remark once Rahm Emanuel did that you should never let a serious crisis go to waste meaning you should never let a crisis go by where you don't use it as a way to do things that you thought you would not be able to do before so for example, this whole the, during 9/11, they used that as an opportunity to pass the Patriot Act and create this huge surveillance apparatus. Um, they used the coronavirus as an excuse to put out all these uh, new regulations and security measures. Well, security measures. And then you have an article recently in Forbes stating, oh, we need to prepare for a permanent pandemic. And then if the whole permanent pandemic based on coronavirus variants doesn't pan out, then it's going to be the climate crisis with climate lockdowns. You know, what, it's going to be one thing after another. And every 20 to 30 years, some crisis will happen that the powers that be can use as an opportunity to go, oh, oh, we have to reach, we, the only way to, to solve this is to give away more of your freedom. And it's not, again, there's no central group of people that plans this. There's no central agenda here. It's kind of undirected. This is just kind of how institutions are. And if you want to see why this is so, just ask yourself the question, at what point will any entrenched institution turn down an offer of more power? When will a large corporation or a government ever say no to more power? Uh, Alex, anything to say? Yeah, a big part of that is just basic human nature, though. Like, a lot of people, once they, they even were poor and they climbed to the top, and they still want more power, too, and more money. And it's it's kind of, it, it I mean, that axiom, power corrupts, that, that has some truth to it. That once a taste of power is kind of addictive, and the more and more you have, the more and more you want. 
Uh, so, of course, people, you know, in elite positions are not going to give up an opportunity to take more power. That, and believing that, oh, they'll, they'll do the right thing, they'll be principled, is naive. <laughs> and, and I'm not, and this is beyond political parties, this is beyond any kind of, uh, you know, serious ideology thing. This is human nature. I don't, like, it's very hard to overcome the addiction that power creates. Right, and what you have to understand is that this doesn't require any sort of central group of people planning everything. All you need is human nature. There are, it's really, I think, ultimately, if you dig down to the bottom of it, it's a result of technology. As technology gets more advanced, you get more surveillance, you get more data collection, you get more and more intrusive government and corporate power. And what then happens is every new crisis becomes an excuse for whatever institution has that power to extend it further. And they'll never say no. And this can be anything as innocuous as like dental insurance that has to do with a transmitter in your toothbrush, seeing how often you brush your teeth, to uh, something like government surveillance like the NSA, to all these mask regulations and so on. So what we need in the long term is like a comprehensive understanding of how technology affects all this. And then on top of that, we also will need a um, basically a plan of action for how to circumvent it. And one good place to begin with that is Heidegger. Uh, the question concerning technology. And this is the funny part. I think everyone watching this stream is following along just fine, even though we're kind of rambling a little bit, they're following the thread of this just fine. But I think that if you were to have a progressive watching any of this, they would be completely lost. I mean, can you imagine the look on their face and the utter inability to follow or put together any of the arguments we're making and the complete and utter inability to understand why we're saying the things we're saying or even like parse a single sentence that I've said. It's amazing because they're so deeply indoctrinated that they can't see outside of their ideology. Not only can they not see arguments to the contrary, but they're incapable of parsing any utterance that is not based on the foundations that their ideology is based on. If you're not speaking from the perspective of a progressive liberal, or a, not even liberal, of a progressive leftist, then they simply cannot understand what you say. Not that they'll disagree dogmatically, as that they're incapable of understanding it is just white noise to them. And that is the really scary thing about this. Um, there is one part here to sort of lighten the discussion a little bit. Uh, and, and I do want to say before I go on, both cynical theories and the parasitic mind are both very cool, and they're both great books that it discuss this aspect of the culture war in great depth. But they are ultimately analyzing a symptom, whereas the cause is the the, the cause is basically the increasing amount of institutional power that comes from advancing technology and all of this are just ways that industrial society extends its control over individual lives and that is ultimately the problem and that is ultimately the biggest deal and but the thing is that's such a big subject that it's hard to tackle for anybody who's not some kind of genius so or, or even, or perhaps not to that extent, but it's hard to tackle for anybody who's not going to be a complete philosopher about it. But I, so, so to lighten the mood though a little bit and back off a little bit from the really heavy side of things, which I see, which I suspect we'll veer back into. I want to read a little bit from this section. Male social justice warriors are sneaky fuckers. That's that's the title of the section. In their infinite desire to appear empathetic, compassionate, and sensitive. Many male SJWs are pursuing a duplicitous mating strategy that has been documented in the zoological literature as the sneaky fucker strategy. Among homo sapiens, especially on university campuses, this is the guy who is the most ostentatiously kind and progressive because it thinks it might give him a better shot with any pretty girl. This is supported by some rigorous and compelling science. Deception manifests itself in many distinct ways in the animal kingdom. Let us begin with the evolution of deceptive warning signals. Unlike the evolution of camouflaging to avoid predators, acrosomatic coloring is an adaptation that makes an animal very visible to prospective predators. 
So this is what he's about to talk about is like poisonous creatures that are brightly colored. Like, hey, I'm poisonous. Don't eat me. Um, and then there are other animals that will color themselves like that. For example, the king snake is an extremely venomous snake that is colored, uh, that has rings around it that go uh, red, yellow, black, yellow, red. And those bands around its body indicate that it is extremely venomous and you should stay away. And that's the king snake. But then there's another snake, I believe, called the coral snake. I think that's what it's called, but it's like a faux king snake. And its bands go uh, red, black, yellow, black, red. So it's a slightly different color scheme, but it's colored similarly to a king snake because it wants to masquerade as one in order to appear dangerous to predators so that nothing will eat it. And this does, in fact, work. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> I didn't even look at it. And then he's like, for example, the coral snake and king snake. <laughs> Because that's the most famous example of this. Red on yellow kills a fellow. Red on black, venom lack. The one I heard was red on black, friend of a jack. Red on yellow, kill a fellow. But, well, whatever. It's the same thing. So, anyway, um, he says that, basically, male social justice warriors are sneaky fuckers. Because there's another form of animal deception, such as the cuckoo bird, where the, where the cuckoo will push another bird's egg out of the nest and lay its own egg in there. And then the other animal ends up raising the cuckoo's child for it, which is where we get the term cuckolding, which is kind of funny that cuck is now an insult used by the right. It fits in a really eerie way. Um, women hold a universal preference for men who exhibit cues associated with high social status, including intelligence, confidence, ambition, the ability to procure and defend resources, and social dominance. Few women throughout our evolutionary history were driven to sexual frenzy at the prospect of mating with an apathetically lazy, pear-shaped, nasal voice, submissive, cowardly, whiny man. Not surprisingly, across all known cultures and eras, men have sought to gain status as a means of being attractive on the dating market, but they've done so via a broad range of trajectories as a function of their unique talents and life circumstances. So, he goes on to say, My familiarity with this form of mating duplicity has led me to apply the sneaky fucker stratagem to a specific human context. I posit that many male social justice warriors are akin to the giant cuttlefish. They don the accoutrements of a sensitive and non-threatening male via their ideological commitment oozing with progressive empathy. In a sense, this is akin to the sensitive guy who befriends women and offers them endless emotional support with the hope that it eventually pays off romantically. Back in the 1980s, John Hughes was responsible for many of the iconic teenage-themed movies of that era, including Sixteen Candles, The Breakfast Club, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and Pretty in Pink. In the latter classic movie, Andy Walsh, played by Molly Ringwald, is a working-class teenager with a romantic interest in Blaine McDonough, played by Andrew McCarthy, a rich kid from the proverbial better side of the tracks. Andy's best friend, Ducky, played by John Cryer, who later gained renewed fame on the TV series Two and a Half Men, is the epitome of the sneaky fucker friend, always there offering his endless sensitive support, hoping that he will eventually be given his due chance at romance. Returning to the male social justice warriors, it is clear that most do not look anything like the Navy SEALs. In other words, they do not exhibit the morphological features associated with physical formidability and social dominance. There is growing scientific evidence that men's economic and political outlooks, what they think about economic redistribution, military intervention, and other topics are often associated with their physical strength. Those who are stronger and more physically formidable are less likely to support egalitarianism and more likely to support military intervention. Irrespective of whether male social justice warriors truly believe their stated ideological positions or are merely faking it as a sneaky fucker mating strategy, it is clear that men's morphological features do indeed serve as signature of their sociopolitical outlooks. So, and this is kind of funny, a little anecdote from my own life, or a little set of anecdotes, rather. Oh, good to see Silvana Popa and Rachel K. Wooder both here. Nice to see you both here around. Uh, but as an anecdote from my own life, there have been a lot of occasions where 
feminists have been attracted to me. It happens a lot. And I mean a lot. Especially on YouTube, there have been quite a few women who were feminists, who were very progressive, who saw my videos on philosophy and suddenly had little hearts forming in their eyes. This has happened at least twice. And it was kind of bothersome because they were both really nice people and they were both really sweet natured and honestly, they were both hot. But I was like, I can't do this. You know, they and they found out I was conservative and lost their minds and thought I had tricked them, even though I had told them both I was conservative. So I'm not really sure what their problem was. I guess it was love goggles. But I, I said all that as a preface to this, which is that I tend to attract female feminists because I kind of look like a male feminist. I don't just mean physically, like because I have the fashionable millennial beard and haircut. It, it's also the sort of the bookishness, the nerdishness, the anxiety, the the. The, the hesitancy, the vocal fry, the affect, everything about me sort of makes me look like a bookish, graduate-educated, upper-middle-class white guy who votes Democrat every single election. So, as a result, whenever I'm around women who are raging feminists, I can almost, I can hear Jaws music. You know, it's like, da 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 -da oh, here she comes. And, you know, thank God I'm no longer single, but yeah, that was, that was a source of great frustration for me for many years. So I guess I'm sort of unwittingly employing the sneaky fucker strategy here. I'm sort of unwittingly being the sneaky fucker. And the, reason, and the way that I'm doing that is by accidentally appearing like a male feminist even though i'm a conservative but 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 the thing is is i go out of my way to tell people that and it still doesn't seem to work i i'm really not sure why uh alex any commentary on that so far well that is hilarious um and i am glad that you're probably not gonna have to deal with it quite so much anymore <laughs> but um uh, the sneaky fucker thing, I loved. Um, I... Honestly, like, it's kind of hard from the perspective of, like, a centrist woman to meet a guy that's worthwhile um, because of the fact that it's like some of the stuff is not very conservative when you're a centrist, but then some of, a lot of it's not fucking progressive that's for certain so it's like ah uh, and dating is a fucking landmine of freaky uh, of those you know sneaky fuckers they're everywhere and uh sometimes it's like okay pronouns in the bio no <laughs> like you know you have your you're like looking for the sneaky fucker shit to avoid it um but uh it was funny, too, because, like, as soon as he was talking about the sneaky fuckers, I was like, like, cuttlefish? Like, before he even brought them up, I was like, like, cuttlefish, right? And then, and I was explaining the idea to my best friend, and he goes, like, cuttlefish. And, <laughs> because we both <laughs> like cuttlefish. So it was, like, obvious where he was going with that. I was so glad he brought up actual cuttlefish, because it's it's such a an interesting uh, biological idea, although he didn't say this, but this there's this thing, so the giant cuttlefish, they fight the males, except for the, the sneaky fucker ones, um, the, you know, sometimes almost like, uh, to the death, to get to the women, uh, and you know, re really the reason why there's so much aggression in the male, um, half of a species is because of how, uh, much they want to have sex, you know, but well, the thing is though, is that, when they, uh, when cuttlefish do that, when they get to the female, they hand her a sperm packet. And I'm like, you're fighting to the death to give someone a sperm packet? Like, it's, I'm, I'm, like, I don't understand biologically what's going inside, going on inside a male cuttlefish that it's so important that they hand that off. Um, because usually most species, there's a pleasure aspect, and I'm like, is there a pleasure aspect to the, the handoff? What the hell? But that's really off topic. <laughs> it, it, well, that, that seems almost gentlemanly, gentlemanly like, like they drop, drop down, down on one non-existent and, and like, like madam. Madam.
Okay. <laughs> you said that, uh, what, did you say that? Did you say that again? <laughs> It's as if they're dropping down on one non-existent knee and going, Madam, I present you with a sperm packet. What's sad is that they die immediately after that. They all do. I present you with a sperm packet. Oh, thump. Yeah. It's ridiculous, but, um, oh, crap. Uh, I have to call uh, my my ac went out last weekend and it just went out again <laughs> i have to call oh, somebody no. um uh but i i loved this chapter i felt like it had so much great stuff in it to really bite down on um and the the idea of equating what i call i call male feminists to um sneaky fuckers is just it's awesome uh, i think that's like a a perfect example of, you know, a perfect analogy. Indeed. Um, we'll wrap this up in about 13 minutes, I think. Uh, I did promise the War Department that I would take her for a long walk today. So we'll have to go at three. Uh, which is, I believe, two your time. I actually moved a time zone. Uh, but anyway, I want to dig into this next session, section rather, self-flagellating at the altar of progressivism. There is another motive or two behind progressivism. Many of the progressive positions espoused by SJWs are a form of self-flagellation meant to atone for some assumed original sin, most likely being a white westerner, and to highlight one's virtuous ideological progressive purity. In this sense, SJW progressivism can almost be seen as an alternative religion to Christianity. Which, I, I've said this many, many times before, progressive politics is Christianity with all of the poison, but none of the antidote. There's all of the original sin, all of the self-flagellation, all of the self-loathing and the questioning and the endless introspection and did I make do a sin, did I do a sin, did I do a sin, did I do a sin, without the forgiveness part. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, that, that's what, part of what makes it toxic. And what really allows you to survive, it's not that white males can't go anywhere under this system. You can be just fine. You just, it's just that the higher you want to rise, the more self-flagellation you have to do. Anything to say? Yeah, I definitely agree with that because we've seen uh, white straight males succeed in this system um but uh, they're not the kind of people i really want to know um <laughs> or spend time with uh and uh but it's and, and, and in fact people of minority groups have been shoved out of like um i keep bringing this up because people keep talking about you know sexism in video games and he brings up anita sarkeesian in this one um but I bring this example up a lot when I'm talking about it on, because video games is kind of a big part of my life, um, that Amy Hennig was shoved out of um, Naughty Dog by a straight white male who followed progressive ideas. So he, you know, he shoved them out. He shoved her out and, and, and was successful while she was, you know, left in the dust because she didn't follow this. And um, so it's so to me, it's sort of like you guys talk about representation all the time, but you don't actually mean it. You mean representation with the right ideas. And that's really disingenuous. Precisely, they claim to be interested in diversity. 
but they're not really interested in diversity. Not only are they not interested in the diversity of race or whatever, because they'll allow something to be only white males if they're all self-flagellating often enough, they're also not interested in diversity of thought. They are literally interested in the exact opposite of what they say they want. What they want is monoculture, one way of thinking, and they want that to dominate everything, and quote-unquote diversity is just a roundabout way of accomplishing so what I would say, you know, it's hard. It's hard to see how to get around this. The first thing is to reject their attempts at dividing everyone. The second thing is to reject the slow creeping of institutional power. And that's a much more nebulous thing. It's the more important thing, but that's really the main task of our age. And it's, it's really up in the air of how to do that. And personally, my, my gut instinct is to say that the way that we get around this, the way that we can sort of circumvent this technological uh, totalitarianism that is creeping in on us, not as the result of any central planning, but just as a natural outcome of the Enlightenment, the way that we do that is by decentralizing technology. If we can make technology, things like AI and robotics and 3D printing and all the rest of it, decentralized enough that any Joe Blow can use it to great effect, then that does a lot to reduce the power of things like the state and large corporations and so on. Heidegger quotes the poet... It, it, he, he has a... Let me start over. Heidegger has a, an essay called The Question Concerning Technology. And in the question concerning technology, he quotes the middle high German poet Hölderlin. I'm pronouncing that wrong. It's like Hölderlin. It's the umlau o. But Hölderlin says, uh, where the danger lies, there the saving power grows. And Heidegger takes that sort of poetic dictum and uses it to say that we cannot reject technology as being the work of the devil because in doing so, we've already fallen prey to technological thinking. So primitivism and return, primitivism, either the Unabomber type thing or the return to monkey, that's not going to work. Where the danger lies there, the saving power grows. If you can decentralize technology, take the place where the danger lies and spread it around, you can defeat the danger. The danger lies in technology and there the saving power grows. I know that sounds very oracular and strange, and it's partially because I'm using the same kind of language that Heidegger does, and Heidegger is famous for talking in a really weird way. He's famously dense, and he likes to use these weird mythological, circumstantial ways of explaining things that sound half crazy if you don't know where he's coming from. But the long and short of it is... The danger from all this ultimately comes from the slow march of technology, and the way around that is for us all to become conscious of it and decentralize the benefits of technology. And in the short term, the short to medium term, the way that cashes out the culture war is by rejecting the excesses of identity politics and not allowing it to be used to divide us. or at least not allowing it to divide us in the way that the powers that be would like. Uh, Alex, do you have a closing statement about any of this? Well, for one thing, uh, a pretty good practical example of the whole therein, uh, wherein lies the danger, therein lies the salvation, is that it? Uh, yes. Probably not. Um, that, uh, I would use nuclear as a really good um, example of that, because nuclear power is both dangerous but also life-saving. It's it creates a um, a much uh, more stable uh, output of power, and um, but people it, people find it scary. It's scary, um, so it's a good idea. So I would use that for an example. But um, again, um, this was a really fun chapter. Uh, and uh, I look forward to talking about the next chapter as well. 
All right. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, and thank you everyone else for showing up. I'm really happy that everyone else came here, and I'm really happy that you all showed up and clicked the like button. Make sure to click that little bell icon so you'll get an alert whenever I stream. And make sure to share this on social media, share it on Twitter, share it on Facebook, Instagram, wherever you can, because I think YouTube is throttling my subscribers and I need all the help I can get. That's all I have.